Hello. How are you guys? Good. Great. Great. Let's pray. Oh, yeah, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for um, your love for us. I thank you, Lord, for you working through normal people. That's it's not our... our power, it's not our numbers, it's not anything to do with us other than obedience. That you succeed in your plans. Thank you for that. I just ask you to bless this time as we dig in. I pray Lord, for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, sir. Now, the angel who talked with me came back and awakened me, excuse me, awakened me as a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I am looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and on the stand, seven lampstands with seven pipes to seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl, the other at, at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and you shall, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple, and his hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord who scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand at his left? And I further, and I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacle of the two gold pipes from which the gold oil drains. And he answered me and said, Do you not know that the, do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Alright, well this is obviously in the context still of Chapter 3, uh, it's the same kind of vision, kind of transition from a dream to a vision. And that's kind of ha happening at the beginning here. Um, the angel of the Lord is speaking to uh, Zechariah. Uh, there's Steve talked to me after, after last week in the, in the, the the Hebrew does not have the ha in it here. The English has the angel of the Lord. The Hebrew doesn't have the ha as in the Hamashiach that, that would be you know, the Messiah or the angel of the Lord. So that it's not, the last week I stated that, that this was um, a Christophany. There's, there's many who believe it is, but it's not, I don't, I don't know that it necessarily is um, because it doesn't have that. That, that word that we set it apart. But this is an angel of the Lord for sure. An angel being a messenger of the Lord. Uh, so that this is a um, an, an angel speaking through Zechariah to uh, both Joshua and Zerubbabel and prophesying over them uh, regarding the rebuilding of the temple, regarding the rebuilding of Jerusalem. <laughs> So verse 4, now the angel 
who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who had wakened out of his sleep. And I, there tends to be two ways that I wake up. One is kind of a groggy, <laughs> half asleep, kind of, you know, and the other is, and it's weird, but there are, I don't deep sleep, but sometimes a certain sound will happen around the house somewhere and I am awake and ready to fight. And I mean now, and it's like I'm wide awake. And so, I don't know which one's here. This could be both he's groggy and not quite sure, or he's woken up in a startle and he's, and he's uh, I don't know, but he's, he's like a man awakened. And, and, uh, but this is a transition here from there's a dream, the angel's speaking to him in a dream, to, I want you to wait for this part. So it wakes him up, and it's a vision, it becomes a vision at this point. Uh, I'm not, honestly not sure what the, what the significance of why is it is the second part a little more you know I want to make sure you got this I, I, I don't I don't know to be honest but it's a it definitely a transition from, from a dream to a vision at this point and he said to me what do you see so I said I'm looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it and on the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to seven lamps. So you, you kind of get a, so this is up describing the menorah. This is, they're, they're rebuilding the temple. It's, it's, it makes sense that the angel's telling him, you know, showing him this thing that's going to belong to the temple. So he sees a golden lampstand. And, I, and you look, if you Google illustrations of this lampstand, you'll get 30 different artist's impressions of what this is. And so, kind of the idea though is you have a main reservoir, a bowl. You've got, you've got a large menorah, and yet that bowl sometimes is represented above, sometimes it's almost kind of part of the base um, that, that, uh, is, that flows up into those lamps. I'm not sure necessarily which is, which is uh, most accurate, but this is a large menorah lit by oil and there was a special process by, by which that oil was to be purified that was put in there. Verse 3 uh, The two olive trees are by it. One at the right of the bowl and the other that is at its left. This is again Zacharias and his lady sees. Which kind of gives us a if we, if we go over to Romans 11. I think we have kind of an idea of what these what are represented in Paul talking about the cultivated and the wild olive tree. Romans 11, 17 through 25. And, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, are grafted in among them, and with them, and with them became a partaker of the root of the fatness of the olive tree. Olive tree. Let me take a step back. So this passage here is uh, talking about the Paul's admonishment to Gentile believers in Christ who have been grafted in not to look in pride or repugnancy towards the Jews who were cut off because he's going to say they can be grafted back in again and they were the the original tree so don't don't stand in some type of you know mini against them you, you should you should um, um, have a respect and a reverence there as well and if you and if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say that branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. 
For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. Who fell. Severity, but towards you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. And we see this as you know, my wife is an example of a, a Jew who was grafted back in. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural, natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So here we see an idea of two separate olive trees again. The are they nest again? The one olive tree is the the, the olive tree of Israel. The other olive tree is the, the wild olive tree. The, the Gentiles is the kind of the idea there. Is this a you know, a picture of both being you know there there's there, there's Places where you can see that the, the menorah is kind of representative of the tree of life. Both of these pouring into that. It's a, it's a you know, it's a, um, these are all very, um, that's the right word, symbolic. And, you know, so it's, it's a, there is some equation, not necessarily a, this is this and this is that. So we need to continue the study of the Word and continue to, to grow in our understanding of that. Um, but it is, I think it's a, definitely an interesting um, area that, that Paul points to these two olive trees that are, that are, stand, that, that are you know, the two sides of, of those who are now in Christ. The, the one that came from the wild tree, us, or they came from the cultivated tree, Jews. Verse 4, So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked to me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And then the, then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. He asked. It wasn't a rhetorical question. Verse 6. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And if you recall it from chapter 3, that, that chapter was kind of discussing, it had some ifs, if thens uh, regarding. Joshua and had some also some promises that I'm going to do this. And they weren't tied to if things, but they were uh, these things will happen regarding Joshua if you walk in my ways, if you keep my commandments. And he also talks about things he's going to do, period, with the branch, the side coming, with um, bringing peace and prosperity uh, to Jerusalem. And so here we have, I think we have a tendency, at least I have a tendency, when there's a, a verse talking about to do the do these things, the Lord calls us to do X, Y, Z, that we measure ourselves, how, how well am I doing on these things, or I'm doing really well, and man, the Lord's blessing me because how well I'm doing, or we're not doing so well, and so at least we, we can become, you know, without hope and downtrodden because we just keep falling from what we're supposed to be doing. And I think this is this is the Lord balancing that out for us, and that yes, we, He calls us to do things. He calls us to respond to Him and His commandments in certain ways, but but also He's saying, you know, 
nothing will be done outside of my spirit. Not by power. Not by my evidence. The power is the idea of, of individual strength, talent, capability. Might is the idea of numbers. You have a lot of a lot of the big army, you have a lot of people, you have a lot of, so you have these two things. It doesn't matter how big you are or how many you are or how, what your capabilities are. It's not going to accomplish this. It's, it doesn't matter how good you are. It's not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It kind of reminds me of Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but more, now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. And that's a that work out your own salvation in fear and trembling is pulled out of this context of the next verse can be a little scary. What do you mean work out my own salvation? But it's, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So yeah, Joshua, I'm expecting you to do these things that I can bless you. But I, but I don't expect you to do these things by your own might and power. I expect you to do these things because I give, I've given you the will to work for His good pleasure. The same thing with Zerubbabel. So, so Joshua's work kind of, he's in charge of the spiritual aspect of the people. Zerubbabel's the civic leader. He's, he's in charge of you know, the, the rebuilding, he's in charge of leading the people from a civic perspective. And both of those, God's not calling either of them to do it on their own. He's saying, you know, this is what you're going to do. But I'm, I'm there. I'm there with you to help you. I'm there to give you the power to do it. No matter how big it seems, no matter how impossible it seems, I'm there to do it. Verse 7. Who are you, O great power? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So there's some prophetic rabbit trails that, that could potentially be in the mountain. But if you remember, this is, if you've seen, if you've been to Jerusalem, or you've seen pictures of it, it's on it. It's called the Temple Mount. It's a, it's a mountain. And so, this may well be describing the, the state of it as it is at this time. That, that it's just a big pile of rubble sitting on top of the Temple Mount that needs to be you know, fixed. Or this could be in the general sense of this is a huge obstacle. That how do you even begin to think about overcoming this obstacle? And it says, oh, well, it's going to be a claim to you. And he shall bring forth the capstone. This is the, the final. It's done. The, fi the final thing with shouts of grace, grace to it. So this idea is that Zerubbabel, and we'll see here in a second, he started it from the from the plumb line of his hand. He's first measuring out the foundation. How he's going to do it from the very beginning to the, to the laying of the capstone. Capstone. Zerubbabel is part of this. And he could easily beat his chest and say, man, I am the man. But he says, grace, grace to him. God did it. God did it. This is grace that we did this. This is by God's grace alone that we are able to complete this. And I think we're beginning to see that the heart of, that we're able to see the heart of Zerubbabel not, not claiming that, uh, that victory of his own. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the temple. I'll leave it back to verse 7, sorry. So, um, this obviously does bring to mind the uh, um, Matthew 17. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have the faith of the mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, move from here to there, and move, and nothing will be possible to you. But that's putting that is not because I am able to generate a powerful thing that's able to move that, but it's because of the Spirit of the Lord moving because of my faith. Spirit of the Lord is 
moving because of Zerubbabel's faith and his choice to do, to follow the Lord in this, that this gets completed. There's an interesting quote from Spurgeon is thinking about a church as, you know, you all get up plans and say, now if the church were altered a little bit, it would go on better. You think if it were different ministers or different church order or something different, then all would be well. No, dear friend, it is not there the mistake lies. It is that we want more of the Spirit. And it's easy, you know, Sunday morning right now is pretty bare. Thursday is just downright bare. And so it's easy to look and say, what is going on? What, what Can we do this, this different or that different or this different? And maybe, but but end of the day, it's the Spirit of the Lord that's going to draw. It's the Spirit of the Lord that, that we need. And, and I was talking to a brother, Brother Mike, this weekend, or this week, and he said something, and we... We need to become more of a praying church. And it's that, that's very true. I mean, it's spe speaking to me. And there's some of you that may be serious intercessors. I'm not. And, and just being transparent and frank with you guys is that, you know, it, is, it has been a struggle for a consistent number of years that, that I, I am consistently praying for the body. But, but yet it's easy for me to look and say, well, if we did this or if we did that, or we, I have no problem coming up with a dozen reasons for us to do something different without ever taking that to the Lord, without ever you know, getting on my knees. Not that I don't ever pray, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's, a, it's an imbalance there, obviously. And so, you know, Mike was bringing that up and they speak to me, man, I need to, I, I need to Make sure that I am taking all of this to the Lord consistently because it's His Spirit that's going to do any work here that's of value. It's not by our might, it's not by our strength, it's not by whether we have blue chairs or red chairs or a certain program for whatever. It's, it's, it's going to be the Holy Spirit doing the work from here, primarily in us first and in us. Uh, to reach others. And so I guess I just you know, encourage you guys as I, as I recommit again to to be consistent in, in my my prayers. Be consistent in actively praying for our body here. Verse 9 and 10. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts, or the hosts, has sent me. Again, like I said, this is from start to finish. Robo was blessed in this. He got, he got, I mean, what, one of the most frustrating things I find at work, and why I am so frustrated lately, we, we start hundreds of things and finish almost nothing. And that's a frustrating. There's something about I think men and men and probably people in general that it kind of feels good to finish something. I got I started this and I finished it. <sighs> finished it, you know. That's frustrating not to. The Zerubbabel is blessed with a huge project by the Lord, and he got to start. He he had it. He's figured out how he's going to lay lay the foundation. He got to place the capstone. What a blessing the trouble will have. It was a blessing from the Lord, the Lord of hosts, sent me to you. For you, for who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of his river well. They are the eyes of the Lord who scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Um, the seven eyes. I mean, I, I'm assuming, given the context, if you go back to three nine, it's talking about upon the stone are seven eyes. Given context, I'm assuming those are the seven, the same, same seven eyes um, that, that, that they rejoiced in the small things. So, 
So you think of, I mean, building something or doing any, anything. There are days where it just seems like nothing gets done. It's, you worked all day, and it's like you look you look back and what? I know I was busy all day today. What did I do? And I, you know, and so the, the the day that he's just measuring out the you know the the how he's going to lay out the foundation, and it's they're looking. They rejoiced in that day, that small day that. Nothing really big happened. And it's just a, an encouragement to me and hopefully to you is that, you know, consistently doing well the little things will add up to big things for the Lord. Consistently doing well the little things will add up in God's economy for sure. It will add up to, to good things that He'll. he'll Accomplish in you and through you. And though they seem insignificant, and I think we need to be careful not to dis despise the day of small things. Going to work day in and day out, going, you know, seems mundane sometimes. Seems, what is the purpose of this? Really, I'm going to do this again? But it's the work the Lord's doing in you in those moments of, of the, the small things that, that will one day become something worth having done just by being consistent. Then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand at its left? And I am, and I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, Lord. <laughs> I, I don't know. If he's trying to remind him of a previous vision or something, but twice here, he asked the question, he said, you don't, you don't know? I mean, I asked you, I don't know, I was asking you a question. So, it's funny how we, do you really not know? Um, but so, so, we have this idea here with these two olive trees is that so, so, there was, there was a specific process by which you would Prepare the oil for the lamps in the, in the temple. But here we see the oil coming directly out of the tree into a receptacle that feeds the bowl that feeds the lamps. So it's a self-purifying process. <coughs> anyway, no need for our input. So it's it's a you know, the Lord is. You know, the oil being in the scripture like the spirit is like a representation of the, of the, the spirit. So this is like the, the spirit working in a way that doesn't need our input to begin to accomplish what he desires. And so he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth, which then obviously points us to Revelations Revelation 11. Three through fourteen. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, 
The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spirit is called the Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood, in their, stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. They ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. And at the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were afraid, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. And so you have these witnesses in the book of Revelation. That this is pointed to as the anointed ones and the olive trees. And the anointed ones, the, the word there literally means sons of oil. So sons, the idea, so when, when the Bible talks about son of something, like sons of Bilal or sons of, it's like they took it to, you know, they, they it's a, like an amplification of, you know, taking it to the next level. They, they, sons of Baal are just very committed to their pagan idolatry, very committed to their, to their perversity, very, and so these guys, that is, that is what defined them, is their walking in the Spirit, their, their connection with the Holy Spirit. Represented by oil, or this is what defined in their walk. And there's, you'll uh, you'll read, and you know we don't really know who these two are. There's I've heard many different suggestions that uh, they're potentially Enoch and uh, Elijah, the two who walked and went to heaven and never actually died. Some people believe that they'll be the two witnesses. I've heard Moses and uh, John the Baptist. And I, I've, I've, you know, it could potentially be somebody we don't know that's named in Scripture. We don't, we don't exactly know. But we, the thing we know about them is they're going to be people who walk according to the Holy Spirit. They walk as sons um, who are flowing with God's Spirit. And so, I guess I'll just summarize that, you know, this whole chapter to me is kind of a, a balance to the do these things, do these things in three, to it's not it's not by your power. It's not by your mind. It's, it is me working through you. Me working it out in you. And I know, you know, sometimes it as a dad. You see sometimes your kids that do something that's like, what in the world are they doing? And in those moments, it's a, we have to kind of step back and, and you know, A, they're not going to be saved because of us. It's, we need to not despise the, the little things, the sitting down and the word with them, the, the getting up in the morning and praying and reading the Bible with them. Don't, don't despise those things, but it's the Lord who is going to work in them what He desires to work in them. And that goes for any area of our life, fatherhood or as a boss or as a husband. Or, you know, sometimes things seem out of hand beyond what we can even think that we can deal with. And yet God's able to 
to take it out, make it into a plane, because Zerubbabel is day in and day out consistent to be the, to do the little things. In that, the Lord is the Lord is desiring to do big things. He did a huge thing in Zerubbabel, but He did. He's desiring to do big things in you. Grace, grace to him, the Lord will do this. That's great. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for these men. I thank you, God, for your word. I just pray, Lord, that um, you would give us understanding. Your word is perfect. Grace, grace. 
Mm. Our Father hears that. That's a very small... I, you know, I'll go back to what we talked about last week. We don't have to. We just got to pray unceasingly. Mm -hmm. We can pray something as simple as grace, grace. Mm -hmm. And He might take that mountain away from Steve or, or uh, from VA or from me or from, you know, I... That spoke to me 20 years ago. So that that is not, I, I, I hate to say it, but I probably use that more than any prayer. Is because that's simple. I wouldn't hate, I, to, I wouldn't hate to say it. I, I mean, it's, I'm not, I mean, it, that's not necessarily specific. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying. That's just to me, that's to, that's just that he gave us that right there in scripture. It's just, to me, it's big part of it. It's big part of it. Thank you. And it's interesting that, you know, if, if any moment in a task, we would be most tempted to be prideful. It would be in the placing of the capstone, I'm finishing, I'm finishing this thing off. It's done. Look what I did. And in that, he's still saying, Trevor Bell's grace, grace to the quality places. God, we need you to do this as he, as he places the capstone. And so I just think that picture of his heart and you know, why the Lord used him in such a way that his heart was towards towards God. Absolutely. Mike, you were talking about uh, when you're in, in a big project and you get faced with a, a big obstacle and you, you don't know what to do, so you, you pray about it. Take okay, true story. When my wife had a, her, her, had a massive heart attack and they, and they, were, and they were starting to stint. And her blood vessel did 360 degree turn. That looked good. And the cardiologist got this wire stuck. Didn't know what to do. He stood back and prayed. Mm -hmm. And he uh, enough to uh, get, it, get it done. So yes, he, he stood back and prayed. prayed. She didn't know that at the time because he told her that later. He prayed. Out of, out of a seemingly impossible situation. Wait, did, you see, did you watch the video of the chance to ask that you? I did not have a chance to do it. I'm all, I'm all, I think I've got everybody's going to be here. I said to you, why did you watch? I'm going to send you all that, that video. Just take 30 minutes and look, listen to it. The guy, not only is he his pastor, but he's his historian, and he was teaching at Gateway. He was a guest teacher. And he goes through, uh, we fix and celebrate July 4th, our Independence Day. But it goes through the, uh, uh, initial doc, uh, uh, Declaration of Independence, and it is just just listen to the teaching because it talks about one of the first things they did in the assembly. I'm not going to for you, but it talks about one of the things it talks about. One of the first things they did in their first meeting was they read four chapters of the Bible and studied oh, hours of Bible study, hours of prayers, prayer time. And it, I think it has John Adams. He's he's got now he's got the official documents. It's not you know he's not made up this stuff. He's got the official documents where they uh, he wrote Abigail his wife and told her that how what God had done this that we didn't do it. Talked about how they got the farmers. Um, you know what you had to be. Uh, he talks about not being disrespectful. What you had to be to, to be a colonel over your regiment to fight the uh, British. You was. A neighbor, Joel, went and got 20 of his neighbor men to enlist with him, and he had his platoon under him, so he got to be a colonel in the army. So technically, it wasn't the colonel and his fancy army that defeated this group of British guys. It was Farmer Joel and his 20 neighbors that defeated this guy. And, it, and, he, and he brings a lot of this stuff to light in that, in that teaching. Really, really good teaching for Fourth of July. I, I made my grandson sit and listen, you know, I made him sit and listen to them. Because, I mean, it's just, I don't think they teach them all this stuff in school. No. I don't know school different. No. But I just, Steve, I just, I'm sitting there thinking, and I knew He's a lot of it because yeah. I heard it in it's, school, but I'm old, you know. I'm not, you are not old. I, but I'm so, you know what I'm saying. The Bible they don't teach it. The Bible used to be a textbook. Yes. It tells about the book that was written. And the, the book that was, the Bible that was ordained uh, and written, and okay by our government, it plainly says, uh, it, how many of them was, was made? 
Do you remember, it's called the uh, 